Hello, everyone. Welcome to A Good Night for a Murder, a Victorian true crime podcast. My name is Kim, and tonight's case is about a strong, independent woman who some might also describe as an enterprising young woman, who also became one of early America's most prolific female serial killers. This is the story of Belle Gunness. But first, a Victorian society tip. Friends, A Good Night for a Murder turned one year old this month. It was June of last year when I launched the podcast with a microphone and a dream, and look how far we've come. Actually, I'm not sure how far I've come, but I am still going. I honestly thought I'd get maybe a dozen downloads per episode, but to this date, A Good Night for a Murder has over 30,000 downloads, and my little voice has been played in over 80 countries. I don't know how that stacks up against other podcasts, but it's way more than I imagined, and for that, I am so grateful to all of you. If you want to give a little birthday gift, you can always just share the podcast with a friend, leave a rating or review, look into signing up for Patreon, and I also have one-time donation options listed on the website at agoodnightforamurder.com. Any financial support just goes right back into hosting and storage fees and such for the show, because as I've said before, I run this podcast all on my own. Now, all of that is to preface tonight's Victorian society tip, which is how to have a Victorian birthday party. Prior to the Victorian era, birthday celebrations were mostly reserved for royalty or members of the upper echelons of society. Birthday celebrations didn't begin to resemble our modern day celebrations until about the middle of the 19th century. And at that, they were mostly a tradition for the children of wealthy families. If you were to attend a Victorian birthday party, you could expect the tradition of giving a birthday gift, just like we do today, though the gifts were not from other children, rather from the adults in the child's life. It was common for a birthday boy or girl to give small gifts to other children who attended, as well as sometimes the household staff. This was nice, I guess, as it was the staff doing all of the work. The gifts were small mementos, such as packages of candies, paper fans, hair ribbons for girls, or bookmarks. Little Victorian versions of goodie bags, right? There were party games, including croquet, walking on stilts, shuttlecock, hoops and sticks, and more. There was also the tradition of giving bumps, which means your friends would lift you into the air once for each year old you were, plus one for the next year, plus one for good luck. You could also expect to be served a birthday cake. Frosted cakes became more common in the mid-1800s as ovens and homes became more common. Victorians also liked to hide little trinkets in their cakes with symbolic meanings attached to them. For example, whoever got the piece with the coin baked in it was predicted to be very wealthy. They also had candles on their cakes. I couldn't find if they used one for each year like we do today, but the tradition of candles and cakes can be traced all the way back to ancient Greeks celebrating the birthdays of gods and goddesses. Also, you may have heard that it's actually illegal to sing happy birthday in public due to copyright infringement. This is why a lot of restaurants have their own crazy birthday songs. Well, this goes all the way back to the Victorian era as well. In 1893, two American school teachers, Sister Mildred and Patty Hill, came up with the happy birthday song as a spin on a greeting song they used in school called Good Morning to All. Though the origin is traced to the Hill sisters, the lyrics and melody together were first cited in 1912, then also appeared in a songbook by Robert Coleman in 1924. In 1935, though, the Summy Company registered a copyright for the happy birthday song we know and love today, giving credit to the Hill sisters as the authors. The copyright registration wasn't set to expire until the year 2030, meaning anyone who sang it publicly could be subject to a fine. At some point, a federal judge in the U.S. came along and ruled the song as public domain, giving us all the freedom to sing happy birthday as we please. Today, the song is widely recognized around the world and has been translated into 18 languages. Finally, I came across a recipe for a traditional Victorian white birthday cake adapted from the book Buckeye Cookery and Practical Housekeeping in 1877 that I have posted in the episode blog on my website. Check the show description for the link or visit agoodnightforamurder.com to find that recipe. My friends, thank you again so much for a great first year. I'm very much looking forward to celebrating many happy returns. A Good Night for a Murder is a true crime podcast that does cover stories including death, violence, sexual assault, and other adult themes. This episode does mention the death of children. Please take care while listening.
Belganis was born Brunhild Paulstadter Storseth on November 11, 1859 in Selbu, Norway. She, along with her mother, father, and seven older siblings, lived on a small farm in Ingbeda, Norway. In addition to her responsibilities on her family's farm, she worked as a dairy maid at neighboring farms where she saved up enough money to immigrate to America. Her sister Nellie had done the same before her and was living in Chicago, Illinois. And that's where Brunhild, at the age of 22, in 1881, was headed as well. When she arrived in America, she changed her name to Belle. She made her way to Chicago, where she found work as a domestic servant. In 1884, she meets and marries a fellow Norwegian immigrant, Mads Sorensen. Together, they open a candy store, but business does not go well, and soon the couple is floundering financially. One day, though, the store catches fire and is completely burned out. The couple claims the fire was caused by a knocked-over kerosene lamp. Though no lamp is apparently found in the remains, their insurance company still pays out on the claim. I couldn't tell if this happened before or after the candy store incident, but they also apparently suffered a fire in their home, which resulted in another insurance payout. The couple used these combined payouts to buy a bigger, nicer home. Now, so far as a family, I don't believe they ever had any children of their own. But starting in about 1895 or so, the couple begins to take in foster children that they care for and raise as their own. I don't think this was in any official capacity. It was more like if a family found themselves unable to support all of their own children, or if a child lost their parents, Belle and Mads would take in that child. So in 1896, the couple finds themselves caring for a little baby girl named Caroline. Her exact birth date is unknown, but it's known that Caroline dies in infancy that same year. The cause is listed as colitis. By this, they likely mean enteritis colitis, which is an inflammation of the small intestine, which can cause stomach pain, vomiting, and diarrhea, which is very dangerous for babies. It's caused by a viral or bacterial infection. Now, many sources on Belganis like to point out that the symptoms of colitis are the same as that of being poisoned. However, Victorians did not know what we know today about sanitation practices. So it is reasonable that the death of baby Caroline could have been entirely natural or unintended due to poor sanitation practices that were considered normal during the time. For example, the Victorians used what would come to be known today as murder bottles. This was a design for baby bottles that were made of glass or earthenware and had a long, narrow neck and wide bottom. A long rubber tube and nipple were inserted into the bottle. The shape of the bottle made them extremely hard to clean, and the cracks in the rubber tubing allowed bacteria to thrive. What's worse, the professional recommendation at the time was to clean these about every two to three weeks. As if that was not bad enough, it was also common practice to add just a little bit of boric acid to baby's milk, as they believed this prevented the milk from souring as fast. It did not, it just covered up the sour taste. So while we'll never really know if the death of baby Caroline was at Belle's hands or not, I think it's important to tell the full story, and the fact of the matter is that the infant mortality rate during the Victorian era was extremely high. One of the reasons for that was because people were going around giving babies boric acid-laced bacteria milk. They just didn't know any better. Belle very well could have fed the baby she cared for this way too. After baby Caroline dies, the couple takes in a new baby named Axel, though he dies in 1898, also of colitis. Again, to us, this sounds suspicious. What's more, most of the sources I used were eager to point out that Bell had taken out life insurance policies on both of the babies and collected payouts when they died. Now, this sounds super suspicious, right? But I looked into this a little further, trying to figure out if it was a common thing to do in the 19th century. Because when I think of life insurance, I, for example, have a policy on my own life with my son as a beneficiary, because if anything happens to me, I want him to be provided for. And what I found out is that you can for sure take out a life insurance policy on a child today as well, though it doesn't seem as common as it was in the 1800s. It turns out it was more common in the Victorian era, and it mostly had to do with covering burial expenses. Like we already said, the infant and child mortality rate was high, and it was just seen as a smart, responsible thing to do when you became a parent. So Belle did care for two infants who died in her care, and she did cash in on life insurance policies for both of them. In my own opinion, we are going to want to call Belle a lot of things before this episode is over. I don't personally think a child murderer is one of them. Moving on. Through the course of 1897 and the year 1900, Belle and Mads did take in three more foster children. 
They were Myrtle, born in 1897, Lucy, born in 1898, and Jenny, who was 10 years old when she arrived. The summer of the year 1900, Belle is a homemaker taking care of the children, and Mads is working to support their family as a department store detective, sort of a security slash loss prevention job. And they decide they want to take out a bigger life insurance policy on him. On July 30th, 1900, Mads comes home from work and complains he has a headache, so Belle gives him some quinine powder, and he goes to lay down in the other room. The mention of quinine powder has had some resurgence lately as an experimental treatment of COVID-19, but in the Victorian era, it sounds like it was mostly used as an anti-malarial medication. But it was also a common cold treatment for, quote, sinus and nasal congestion, headache, feverish feeling, muscular aches, and pain, temporary constipation. It's definitely not what I would reach for first for a headache, even in the year 1900, but who knows, maybe it's just what she had on hand. Or maybe Belle had more sinister motives. Because when she goes to check on him a while later, he was dead. As it turns out, that exact day of July 30th, 1900, was the one day the two insurance policies Belle held on Mad's life were active. The old policy would expire at the end of that day, and the new policy started that day meaning Belle was positioned to receive payouts from both policies, which she got. Now, one doctor thought he saw signs of strychnine poisoning there, but their family doctor had treated Mads for an enlarged heart in the past, so the cause of death was ruled as heart failure and no autopsy was performed. With the money she received from the payout in both of those policies, Belle purchases a pig farm on the outskirts of Laporte, Indiana, packs up herself and her three foster daughters, and moves to the country for a fresh start. After the move, she becomes reacquainted with a fellow widower and Norwegian immigrant, Peter Gunnis, and they marry on April 1st, 1902. Peter brings with him to the marriage a one-year-old daughter and a five-year-old daughter. One week after their marriage, Belle is alone in the home caring for her one-year-old stepdaughter when the child dies. There are no more details I could find on the baby's death. Sources just report that Belle was alone with the child. The next thing you know, the child is reported dead. I could find no cause of death listed. As I mentioned earlier, this sounds super suspicious to us. But again, I think it's important to keep perspective and I want to tell the full story. So again, high child mortality rate. And also, Peter did have a middle daughter from his first marriage who did not survive past the age of nine months. And this was while he was still with his first wife. He hadn't even met Belle yet. Also, there is no insurance policy mentioned with the death of this child. So Belle didn't benefit from their death financially anyway. In my personal opinion, like I said before, I don't find the death of Belle's stepdaughter super suspicious, but what happens next is a little sus. In December of the same year, Peter is hit in the head by a falling meat grinder and he dies. He was only 30 years old. Now, a lot of people find this hard to believe. Also, Belle's oldest foster daughter, Jenny, let it spill to her classmates that her mama had killed her papa with a meat cleaver. The coroner also found Peter's death suspicious as well and called for a coroner's inquest, but nothing came of it. There was not enough evidence for a trial, and in the end, Belle received the life insurance payout for Peter. Now, it would turn out that all this while, Belle had been pregnant, and in 1903, she gives birth to a son she names Philip. And the next two years or so are uneventful, but in 1905, Belle decides she's ready to marry again, and she places a personal ad in a couple of Norwegian-American newspapers. The ad reads, Comely widow who owns a large farm in one of the finest districts in LaPorte County, Indiana, desires to make the acquaintance of a gentleman equally well provided with view of joining fortunes. No replies by letter considered unless sender is willing to follow answer with a personal visit. Triflers need not apply. Shortly after this, Belle begins receiving gentlemen visitors at her farm. And when they arrive, Belle, who is usually seen dressed for farm chores, will be wearing her nicest dresses. And they would arrive with trunks looking as if they intended to stay for a while. If anyone asked, she would say they were cousins. Then, one day, whoever her guest had been as of late would just be gone. In most cases, though, their trunks and belongings would be left behind. And did Belle know where they went? Well, she responded that she was asking herself the same thing. Damned if they didn't just walk off one day and never come back. All in all, throughout 1905 into 1907, there were perhaps upwards of 20 or so men who allegedly made their way to the farm of a wealthy widow in Laporte, Indiana. 
Many of them were said to have withdrawn all or nearly all of their savings before visiting, and they were headed there to either marry or enter into some sort of investment opportunity. Plus, it sounds like many of them were discouraged from sharing their intention or destination with their friends and families. Whoever they were going to visit had asked them to keep it a secret. Also in 1906, amidst all of these mysterious comings and goings at Belle's farm, her oldest stepdaughter, Jenny, disappears as well. To anyone who asked, Belle said she was sent away to school in California. Now, the revolving door of men who turned up looking ready for an extended stay, then disappeared without a trace, was noticed and gossiped about in town. But the help she hired on the farm had a front row seat to it. And one of her hired farmhands was a man named Ray Lamphere. Bell hired Ray in 1907, but she was not only his employer, the two also struck up a romance. Ray worked for Bell from 1907 into 1908, during which he lived at the farm. Now, seeing as he lived there, he could tell that these men were not cousins. It was clear that many of them were showing up with amorous intentions. And seeing as he was romantically involved with Bell, this probably stunk a little bit. Then, in January of 1908, Bell introduces the latest arrival, Andrew Helgeline, as her new fiancé. This apparently caused turmoil in Bell's relationship with Ray, whatever relationship that was, and it led to Bell firing Ray a few weeks after her engagement announcement. Despite Andrew being introduced as Bell's fiancé, that does not save him from whatever fate befalls the men who visit the Gunnis farm, and in February of 1908, he disappears as well. After this, Bell launches a campaign to have her former lover and farmhand Ray committed to an insane asylum. She claimed he was dangerous and was a menace to the public. It went so far that local authorities actually conducted a sanity hearing for Ray Lampere. To Bell's dismay, though, Ray was declared sane. Having failed at her attempt to have Ray committed, she starts lodging trespassing complaints against him. And it sounds like these were founded, actually. Ray did keep turning up at Bell's doorstep and was taken away multiple times. She continued to document complaints with police, stating that she feared for herself and for her family. Meanwhile, it's now been a few months since Andrew has up and left his home for Bell's farm, and his family is concerned about him. His brother, Asla, searches what belongings his brother left behind and finds love letters from Bell to Andrew. In one, she writes, To the dearest friend in the world, no woman in the world is happier than I am. I know that you are now to come to me and be my own. I can tell from your letters that you are the man I want. It does not take one long to tell when to like a person, and I like you better than anyone in the world. I know. Think how we will enjoy each other's company. You, the sweetest man in the world, we will be all alone with each other. Can you conceive of anything nicer? I think of you constantly. When I hear your name mentioned, and this is when one of the dear children speaks of you, or I hear myself humming it with the words of an old love song, it is beautiful music to my ears. My heart beats in wild rapture for you. My Andrew, I love you. Come prepared to stay forever. So Asla writes to this bell woman and says he hasn't heard from his brother in many months now and does she know where he is? Bell responds, wherever he is, he's certainly not there. He was there, but he left. Maybe to visit family in Norway and she does not count on him coming back. Asla tells her he does not believe her. He thinks she knows where his brother is and he does not believe her story that he's gone to Norway. He thinks he's right there, still in the port, and he intends to come there and find out. Rather brazenly, Belle responds, well, he's welcome to come look, she'll even help him, but she expects him to pay her for her time. Maybe she thought this would discourage Asla from coming, but she was wrong, and Asla starts making his way to the port. Before he can get there, though, on April 28 in 1908, the Gunnis farmhouse burns to the ground with Belle and her three children inside of it. Actually, that last statement isn't 100% correct. In the burned-out remains of the home, authorities found the charred bodies of three children and the body of a headless woman. For this reason, arson and murder are suspected, and it's assumed the headless body is actually Belle Gunnis. But they need to be sure. So they prepare to start searching the property for where someone might hide or bury a head. In the midst of this investigation, Oslo shows up looking for his missing brother. He speaks to police who tell him, well, obviously there's been a catastrophe, but he can take a look around and see if he spots anything indicating his brother might have been there at some point. Asla speaks to a farmhand of Bell's and asked had he been asked to dig anywhere or bury anything on the property recently. The farmhand indicated that yes, he'd been asked recently to bury some garbage in the hog pen. Upon further inspection, multiple slumped depressions are visible in the hog pen. 
meaning that there is likely something under there that the earth is settling around. So they start digging. And it isn't long before they start to unearth body parts. They're finding bones, teeth, arms with men's watches on them. All in all, they uncover a total of five bodies from that area, and one of them is identified as Oslo's missing brother, Andrew Helgelin. Investigators grimly realize this is a bigger job than they anticipated, and they're going to need more manpower. So in the following days and weeks, they return with over a dozen men and begin to excavate the entire farm. They turn up the remains of even more bodies, all cut apart, usually wrapped in gunny sacks or oilcloth. It was noted on the second day of digging they found an additional six bodies, but after that, they're said to have stopped counting. Not all remains could be identified, but some of those who were included Belle's own foster daughter, Jenny, who she had said gone away to school in California, Ole B. Budsberg of Alola, Wisconsin, who vanished in May 1907, Thomas Lindbo, who had left Chicago to work as a farmhand for Gunness, Henry Gerholt of Scandinavia, Wisconsin, who left his home intending to marry Belle, and Benjamin Carling of Chicago, who had left with a large sum of money to secure an investment with a wealthy widow in Laporte. There are at least 20 more missing person reports with similar sounding stories where families never found out what happened to them, but we can be sure at least some of those were probably victims of Bell. So in light of recent events, authorities need to be super sure now that the body of the headless woman in the burned down home is Bell Gunnis, because if it's not, she could be out there somewhere. And in that case, she's to be brought in for murder. So remember that in recent months, Bell had filed several complaints against her former farmhand, Ray Lamphere. They decide to start with him, so they go and they bring him in, and when he's arrested on suspect of murder and arson, he is wearing an overcoat and watch belonging to two of the identified victims buried on the Gunnis farm. They do convict Ray on the arson charge, but they're unable to get him on the murder charge. The main reason being, they can't prove the body is that of Bell Gunnis. And as long as they can't prove the murder of Bell Gunnis, they can't charge him for the deaths of the three children either. So the local dentist comes forward and says if they can find any dental remains, he could probably use his records to help with an identification. So they set up some sort of sluice operation to start sifting through the rubble in the basement, and lo, they find bridge work that the dentist confirms belongs to Bell. So the coroner actually rules that that is indeed the body of Bell Gunnis. But at the trial, they call a jeweler to comment on the condition of the gold crown work compared to some pieces of gold jewelry also pulled from the fire. And he testifies that compared to the condition of the gold jewelry, it does not look like that bridge work has been in a fire. What's more, a couple of local doctors apparently took an actual human jaw with a similar piece of bridge work and burned it in a blacksmith's forge until the bone crumbled. This was actually pretty smart because the fire would have had to be hot enough to allow for the consumption of an entire skull, but leave behind the bridge work. They found that the porcelain parts were pitted and marked and the gold crowns were slightly melted. By comparison, the bridge work they pulled from the rubble was in much better shape. Additionally, the body was noted to be roughly 5 inches shorter and 50 pounds lighter than Belle, so it couldn't possibly be her. Nowadays, we know this could very well be the natural result of the fire, but I'm not sure they knew this back then. Because of this, though, Ray's defense attorney was able to effectively argue that the bridge work was potentially planted, and it's possible Belle had faked her own death and escaped. So Ray escaped the murder charge, but was convicted of arson. And on November 26, 1908, he was sentenced to 2 to 21 years in the state prison in Michigan City, Indiana. The accounts of what Ray had to say from here on out are hearsay. It was said that he later confessed to helping Belle murder and bury her victims on the farm. She would lure them there with promises of a happy, comfortable, financially secure marriage. Then she would take their money, murder them, and have them buried in the hog pen. When she heard Andrew's brother was coming to her farm to look for him, she decided to skip town. So she herself lured a woman there under pretense of employment, murdered her, removed her head so she couldn't be identified, suffocated her children, and set fire to the house with the children and planted body inside. She had paid another hired farm worker very handsomely to plant her bridge work in the remains should anyone question the identity of the body. This would explain the good condition they were in. Ray claims he knows all of this because he was supposed to leave with her. But Belle had other plans and used a different escape route, and by the time Ray realized, she was long gone. Authorities did look into her finances as part of the investigation, and they did indeed find all but one of her accounts were completely drained shortly before the fire. 
Now, there is another version of events here, also allegedly from Ray himself. In December of 1909, Ray contracted tuberculosis in prison, and a reverend was sent to speak with him. He offered the reverend a different story that the reverend was said to have transcribed, had Ray sign, and then he locked it away, never intending to share it with the world. Ray did die from tuberculosis shortly thereafter. Time goes by, and a journalist starts pressuring the reverend to let him publish Ray Lanfear's confession. And eventually, the reverend's desire to give the families of Bell's victims some peace wins out, and he agrees. In this account, Ray takes credit for all of it. He does not admit to murdering any of the victims found on the farm, though he was complicit in Bell's schemes and burying the bodies. In the end, he had a falling out with Bell, where in a rage, he turned on her and her children with an axe and burned the home to cover his tracks. The key takeaway here is that Bell was indeed dead. However, not everyone believes that story, because in the end, the remains of the adult woman found in the blaze were never positively identified. As such, sightings of Bell continued over the next 30 years in various cities throughout the U.S. One of the most notable instances is that of Esther Carlson, who murdered her employer for financial gain in Los Angeles, California, in 1931. But that is a story I'm saving as the bonus content for Housekeeper and Butler tier Patreons. Now, despite the open-endedness of Bell's whereabouts, remember the coroner did rule the adult woman found in the fire to be Bell Gunness. So they buried her next to her first husband, Mad Sorensen, in the Forest Home Cemetery in Forest Park, Illinois. This is kind of weird. I don't know why they did this. I thought at first, well, maybe they buried her last husband with his first wife, but no, he's right there in Laporte, Indiana. Maybe because they were burying her with her children, two of which she raised with Mads. I don't really know, but you can imagine Mads looking on from the afterlife, seeing what Belle did, and then they bring her back to be next to him? I'm so sorry about that, Mads. Anyway, in 2007, a team of forensic anthropologists and graduate students from the University of Indianapolis exhumed the remains with the permission of a descendant of Belle's sister to try and confirm the identity of the body. They had a sealed letter recovered from the Gunnis farm they were hoping to gather enough DNA from to either confirm or deny the identity of the body as Bell. But unfortunately, it didn't work and the remains were reinterred without any answers. They tried. If you head over to Instagram at a goodnight for a murder, you can see some photos of Bell and her family, Raylan Fear, and the Gunnis farm. You can also see the photos and source links on the episode blog on my website at a goodnight for a murder.com. While you're on the website, you can sign up for the Goodnight for a Murder newsletter. Each month, I send an episode roundup, a reveal of next month's episodes, and other goodies like extra Victorian society tips, book recommendations, and more. For bonus content for Housekeeper and Butler tier Patreons for this episode, as I mentioned earlier, I have the story of Esther Carlson, who many thought could be the same person as Belle Gunnis. To subscribe to Patreon and learn more about the podcast, you can visit a goodnightforamurder.com. Also follow me on Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube at a goodnightforamurder. Please rate and review and share with friends. Thank you for listening, and I will talk to you again soon. Mm-hmm.